Hi, it's June 10th, 2006, and Bruce and his mom, Jerry, are sitting at my house at Blue Heron Lane in Missoula, Montana. My mom is here visiting because my daughter, Ariel, just graduated from high school, and we had a wonderful uh, graduation weekend with lots of family visiting, which is what we like the most. It was great. And I've been recording my mom in a series of recordings about her life, about her memories, and about her history. And we're going to do another such recording today. I wanted to talk to her about her life and the world of music. So that's what we're going to do. And that's the best part of my world. War. So we're sitting here now, Mom, and way back in the distance, you just hear a song in. That song was by Count Basie. Ah. Way in the back, we've got a, a big band channel playing on my on my music selection. Did you know anything about Count Basie? Oh yes, it's wonderful. Well, we had a bunch of bands. We had Ellington then and Basie, and uh, they all played, well, they, they played a little wilder music than the other bands did, I thought. They always had moaning saxophones, and uh, it was good music. It was ahead of its time. And Cab Calloway, he wasn't in their uh, category, but he was almost. So you lived most of your life around music. I was wondering if you'd talk a little bit about, you know, it's always hard to remember back into your past when you're a child, but what are your very first memories of music, the first ones you have? Well, First ones I have are my mother singing to me. She had a beautiful voice, operatic voice. I remember that. Uh, she used to sing a song to me called Mighty Like a Rose. It's very beautiful. Don't know what to call you, but you're mighty like a rose. And of course, my dad was around and always at the piano, wherever there was a piano. And the first thing I remember that was very exciting was when I was about four, four and a half, four, I uh, traveled with the band my dad was playing in. And we went to St. Louis for a summer job there. And I, we traveled with the band. My mother was there. We, I was the only child. And uh, the band sort of adopted me. I was the pet. Somebody always carried me around and when they took pictures of the group. They always had me in the picture. Now, let me ask you, when you were four years old, where were you living? I'm trying to remember. New when, York City? When we moved from Connecticut to New York, we first lived in the Bronx. And uh, we were there a few years, and then we moved out to a city called Flushing, which was on the north shore of Longwell pretty near the North Shore of Long Island, and we were all renting then. And we had a house there on Cherry Avenue, and uh, my dad would go into the city to work, because he was doing mostly radio shows at that time. And um, then we moved to the suburbs, to Bayside, where my folks bought a house, a nice big house. And uh, that house used to belong to Zeke Field's manager. I remember that at the time. His name was Sharp. Anyhow. So your, your dad was in a band in your, early, your earliest memories he was playing, but yeah. you know, most of my image of him is as a composer and yeah. arranger, but he was actually a working musician for a long time. Well, when he first came over from England and he was 17, 18 years old, he had to make a living and he was trained more as a concert pianist than he was. He didn't know anything about jazz, but of course he was a good musician and pretty smart. So he caught on, and then he was a very great advocate of jazz. He loved, well, or pop music. And uh, then he started working first in Connecticut with a band that was pretty well renowned. It had, a, uh, they traveled all over New England. Then he went to New York and uh, lucky, he got in the uh, orchestra of Vincent Lopez, who was one of the top five, I would say, bands in the country, and um, stayed with him quite a while. And he, uh, Vincent Lopez was a very, f I remember him. So this first memory you had of going on a tour to St. Louis, 
Uh, what kind of band was it? What was the instrumentation? Was it orchestral or was it, what oh, was it? It's hard for me. What's your guess? Just that, I think. I'm trying to remember. Were they, uh, would they be playing for dancers or playing for people sitting Playing there? at a hotel, eating and dancing. Oh, a so very it wasn't, swanky it wasn't place. A concert type oh, of no, no, no. Yeah, but. Uh, so he was playing popular music even yeah. then? Yeah. Well, it's not hard for a concert musician to be able to play popular music. What was, uh, what was your father's history in music? How did he start? You say he was a concert musician. Well, uh, he started studying music when he was very, very young. And of course, he uh, didn't go to a regular high school. He went to the London Academy of Music, which is where young musicians went that had serious thoughts of careers. And he studied both violin and piano. And he, uh, he was pretty good on the violin, too. And um, he uh, played many, many concerts when he was at the Academy. And I have programs with the selections, and some were pretty difficult. But he had wonderful teachers there and some well-known. Of course, I was, I just know from looking at clippings what he was doing and what he was playing, but he had many honors. And uh, then... Uh, Did he have any very special honors or special performances? He played a command performance. And what's that? That's when you play for royalty. And that's a very great honor in England, or in London. In England, uh, only the finest musicians, or potential musicians, do that. I don't know who the royalty was. It may have been the cousin of the Queen and King, or maybe it was the King and Queen. I don't know. Anyhow... But, it was, but, uh, but was he sort of a prodigy? I mean, was he yeah. that good? He had two or three very famous men that were teaching him. Uh, he took theory, and he took piano, and he had two fine piano teachers. He went to both of them. And uh, he graduated from there with both violin and piano. And then uh, at this time, his father, my grandfather, was had a band called the Blue Hungarian... What was the last name? Something. Blue Hungarian something. And they played at the resorts in... England, out of London. Hastings was one of them, and... Uh, what was your, this was your grandfather? Yeah. What was his name? His name was Bernard, Bernard Nussbaum, and... Did uh, you have a middle name that you remember? I don't know it, no. And so he, you say he had a band, in what way did Oh, a big a band? band, they they wore... But I mean, was it his band? Yeah. They wore uniforms with the epaulets, the gold, and big tall hats and uh, they used to play like Sunday concerts and during the afternoons at the resorts and crowds of people would come out because well that was the entertainment of the day and it was a very good it was called the Blue Hungarian Band that was it and it was a band it wasn't an orchestra you know it was on the order of bands more horns and no strings Probably. No. So um, <clears throat> he had a job for years doing that. Now, what was did, what was his instrument? Gee, I don't know. He played everything. Oh, did he? He taught us piano. And uh, I think he had a pretty good working knowledge of all instruments. Just like my dad had a working knowledge of them. If you're going to be an arranger, you have to know what your instrument's going to do. So anyway, this went on, and my dad was very interested also. And now, put, was Bernard Nussbaum married at that time? Yes. What, what do you know about his wife? What was her name? His wife's name was Charlotte. Her maiden name was Worm, W-U-R-M, Charlotte Worm. And she played violin also, and she came from Poland. And uh, she came from a family who were very well known. They were milliners to the royal royalty in uh, Poland. I don't know who it was then. But anyway, um, my grandfather married Charlotte, and uh, they, they had a family, what, two boys and th four, three, four girls, 
I'm trying to remember. And everyone played. I mean, there wasn't an instrument that wasn't represented there. So, uh, but my dad... So I, that, that's the home your house, your father was born into. Yeah. My dad was the oldest one, so of course he probably got a little more attention in the beginning <laughs> before the rest came. So, um, where am I getting to now? Along now, my dad's graduated from uh, the academy, and all of a sudden here we were in World War I. And of course, his folks were frantic. They didn't want him going into the army, not with the background he had and the potential he had. They, so they, uh, and besides that, my grandfather lost his job. They stopped the band concerts and all that frivolous nonsense, I suppose. Why? Well, I don't know. They probably thought that people could do more useful things, or I don't know what. Well, somewhere in your family there's a story of a band that lost its employment because of anti-German sentiment. Is that ringing a bell with you? Well, they were called the Blue Hungarian Band. I don't remember that. That was the that. Nussbaums. What about those brothers that I always hear about? Yeah, they? Simon Worm. That was a brother of my grandmother. And she had several people that were in theatrics in her family. But, of course, uh, I don't know if their names were Jewish or not. Is Worm a Jewish name? Well, it might not be because it was Jewish. Nussbaum no, I might certainly be remembering is. remembering something that you don't but from yeah. talking to other relatives. But it seemed to me that during the anti-German World War I hysteria, one of your family lost their job at Blackpool or somewhere. That was and, my grandfather. And they actually filed a lawsuit and fought through oh, the I courts did. and eventually won because British law, much like our own law, requires no discrimination. Yeah. And they hadn't done anything wrong but have the wrong last name and be kind of Prussian in their look and in their... Uh, well, I'm glad to hear that because yeah. I didn't know there was a lawsuit. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, Nussbaum is a very giveaway name mm -hmm. if you're going to run into prejudice. So uh, you're talking really about how your father came to America when you talk about this draft? and then Yeah. Well, they, they, they sent him... Before he was 18, he was 17 when he came over here. And they just wanted to get him out of the country before he would be, I guess they had a draft like we did. I don't know what they had. And then uh, the family uh, had a little bit, uh, my grandfather I think started teaching when he lost his job because he had a very good income as a conductor and uh, when he lost that, he had to do something else. So he started teaching, and he could teach. He had a sign out with four or five different instruments listed on it. And my dad was on his way to America, and uh, I, I can't what remember. Was the, what was the connection? What was he going to do when he got here? Well, Grandma's relatives, some of them, had come over. When my grandfather played in the uh, amusement places and the watering places in England, um, one of my grandmother's brothers had charge of the entertainment. So my grandfather worked really under him. In other words, they put Simon Worm Presents, conducted by... Bernard Nussbaum. So, um, one or two of these relatives went to the United States. I suppose when trouble started brewing, it started brewing pretty soon in Poland. And uh, they uh, had contacts and they very quickly got into a music business more or less, or entertainment business. So when my dad came over with the thought of going to work for his uncle. And they met him when he came, and I don't remember how much money he had in his pocket, but I, I've seen the page from Ellis Island where he came in with all his statistics and uh, so forth. 
and he was met. Those people that had relatives here had it fairly easy. They didn't have to scramble and worry about what they were going to do. They had shelter and they could look for work. So uh, I don't know what exactly happened as soon as he got here, but I know he must have gone to work for Simon, Simon Worm. And uh, I don't know if he liked it or not. But, you know, he wasn't a, a popular pianist by any means. He was, uh, but he, he was a fast learner. <laughs> so he, he applied himself. And uh, I, I'm trying to think of how he went to New Haven where he met my mother. I'm, I can't quite grasp it. I know he used to play uh, the piano, he'd play music for the moving pictures, which were silent in those days. And I have one bo book he kept that has every movie listed that he played for, plus the stage uh, performers that were on, and, and how much time the music took, and so forth. And that was how he made a living. Of course, they used a lot of classical music then in those silent movies. Now, I... Uh you know, uh, Mom, my memories can be wrong, but I've heard stories from different people at different times. And what I heard was that he worked for his uncle for quite a while, but eventually he began to be discontented. Yeah. He was talented, he was underpaid, overworked. That's and right. And he decided to break out on his own, and the way he broke out on his own was there was some work for musicians like him in New Haven, where there were there were uh, there was theater. Yeah, there were like I don't know if you'd call it summer stock or what. Well, we had a few legitimate theaters. There's oh, a yeah? Schubert Theater in New Haven, and there's another theater. I can't remember the name of it. The, uh, very often, the uh, shows that were going to be presented on Broadway were previewed in New Haven. They went there and tried them out, and then corrected any mistakes they found or things they wanted to change, and then they'd go back to Broadway. Perfect. So there was work, and he went to work for one of the leading bands in New Haven after a bit. You knew that? No. His name was Ernie Rapp, and he had a band, and it was a nice, popular band. They played a lot of dances and so forth, and uh, traveled to other states, New England states mostly, and there was a younger brother of Barney Rapp who was, became a very famous singer. In fact, when he, he was called Young Rapp when he sang with the band. And then when he grew up, he was named Barry Woods. And he sang on the Hit Parade, which was a very popular big radio show later on. Anyway, that's the story of the band he was with. So the, the Worms were related to Bernard Nussbaum. Well, his, brother-in-laws. Because he married a worm. He married a worm. That was... Right. That what was do him. you know about Bernard Nussbaum's parents? Were they ever even in the picture? Were they ever in England? Or you just never heard? I've heard something about orphans. Have you? No. Well, I was told that he had a brother. And... Uh, I, I, there's no nothing I know about it. So the Worms were his in-laws, but in the end, Joe Nussbaum came to the USA and left his family at home. Yes. Now I've heard that as he got more and more successful here, he helped his family come yes. and join him. Who who came here? Well, first his father came. Bernard came. Was Bernard a widow at the time? No, no. The whole family was living together on Princess Street in London. And uh, there was uh, Charlotte, and there were, it was Albert, his youngest brother, and then there were three sisters, no, four, Helen, Jenny, Pauline. Was there another sister? I don't think so. And they all were trained musicians. My grandfather was a very strict parent as far as music was concerned. I mean, there was no sloughing off because you were the <laughs> his uh, kids. So, um, 
first Bernard came over, and I think it was in 19... Let's see, I was about three. It was the summer we spent in St. Louis that he came over because the weather was very, very hot. He wasn't used to it, and he developed pleurisy. I don't know what gives you pleurisy, but he drank ice water by the gallon. And in England, they don't drink ice water, or they didn't then. And uh, he was very sick. He used to take me in, uh, in the pony cart to the zoo every day, St. Louis Zoo, which is very famous and very wonderful. I remember it well. And uh, we'd go in the pony cart, take a ride through the zoo, and stop. And it was wonderful. Anyway, Bernard uh, lived here without his family for, I don't know, maybe a year or two. I'm just guessing because I've never, I should have asked about that, and I didn't. So anyway, uh, pretty soon the family came over, the girls and the younger brother and Charlotte, the mother, and they also brought their uh, maidservant along. Her name was Fanny, and she'd been with the family for several years. In fact, she stayed with the family until she died, and she's buried in the same plot in the cemetery that they are. Uh, Fanny was a good English cook. She did make things a little heavy and too much fat, but she was a good cook. And I remember when they came over, they brought their feather beds, and I used to run and jump into them when I used to visit. Anyhow... Well, you lived in New Haven. Where did that family live? Well, uh, let me remember. Did they move to New Haven where you were? No. I don't think they did. I think they probably moved somewhere near her relatives. First time I remember, they settled in on Long Island when they finally uh, they got a house. I don't know. I can't answer you. Was, was it a whole family of musicians? Yes. And when they did work, did they work at music? Well, um... Uh, I don't know when they started getting into the business of copying, do you? I hadn't heard. So uh, they were copyists? Yes. And what does that mean to you? Well, they had a beautiful hand as far as music was concerned. They could write like it was done on a computer or something. It was so perfect. And they were in uh, great demand fairly yeah. soon. Who were they? Which ones were they? Helen and Jenny, and I don't know if uh, Albert did, I don't think so. Did he for a while? He did play. He played because he was a young man and he wanted a more eventful life and more fun. So he used to play on cruise ships. But Helen and Jenny uh, would give a few lessons maybe and do copying. As soon as my dad started to, uh, when he stopped working in orchestras, and started arranging. For instance, when he went to work for Vincent Lopez, that was one of the top five bands in the United States. They were centered in New York, and uh, my dad would play piano, and he would back up Lopez, who wasn't a very fine pianist, but he wanted to sound fine, so my dad would be on a piano back <laughs> somewhere. Uh, uh, so it, it sounded like a double piano, but it wasn't. But it made Lopez sound great. He was very famous, and his theme song was a song called Nola, which was very well known at that time. In fact, I went with my dad up to the apartment of the original Nola that the song was written for. Anyway, when he started playing with Lopez, then he started arranging. And he must have had a very great knack for it, because he he did beautiful work, and he was especially gifted uh, with vocalists. He never fought with the vocalist. He always made an arrangement that flattered the vocalist, and uh, he was just good. He had a lot of feeling, and uh, I remember when he 
He started to do radio, and I'm trying to remember the year because he had a program on three times a week, and it was only a 15-minute show. But uh, Ring Crosby sang one of the segments, and who was the other one? It was, it was an Italian opera singer named Nino Martini, and then there was a, a lady opera singer, Rosa Poncel. And uh, those three, and then they'd rotate and maybe get others, and uh, they were all good voices. So and, he, he prepared the music. Did he also perform? And, and no. No? He just did the music on the radio shows, yeah. And this one lady who was very prominent in opera developed a very big crush on my dad, and she was calling the house all the time. I don't know if my mother appreciated that or not, but anyhow, I remember even answering the phone once or twice, although I was pretty young then. So um, then he had a, a few other programs he was working for, a half-hour program. So I'm was that considered remember. sort of a big step up to break into radio? Oh, yes. Radio was new then, you know. And um, all the big performers were on radio that they could get. And uh, Dad did a lot of that. He was busy, busy, busy arranging. He, was, he, he tried to compose a little bit. He did compose when he was in New York. He, he never had a big hit, but he had some minor hits. I remember going to the Roxy Theater, which was the forerunner of the radio music hall. In fact, they called the dancers Rockettes. Well, they used to be Roxyettes at the Roxy Theater. And I went to see my dad's song that was called Fascinating Vamp. And it was a very syncopated song. And the Roxyettes danced it, and I was in seventh heaven in the audience telling everybody in three rows around me that, that was my dad's song. I was so, so tickled with it. And um, he was getting uh, prominence now. You know, uh, he worked for Sam Fox, the publisher. So and obviously, by the time these things were happening, you were living back in New York? We so went, what, what when he uh, worked for Vincent Lopez, we were in New back, York. That's right. So about what age were you when you left New Haven? Pretty young. Mm. Well, Jay's about five years younger than I am, and my mother was pregnant with him when we went on a band trip. I'm trying to remember which one, whether it was Atlantic City or, or mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure. Anyway. So let, me, let me interrupt you and ask you, what, in, around your house, was it kind of expected that every child would be involved in music? Definitely. No ifs or buts about it. <laughs> we all started piano when we were pretty young. And my grandfather was our piano teacher, and oh my, was he strict. I have friends that used to tell me about the little pieces they'd play well and how easy it was and they liked it. And my grandfather wouldn't let us play any pieces until we learned all our scales, major and minor, arpeggios, contramotion. We had to practice. So you, you didn't get to go in and play Twinkle Twinkle no. the first day? Huh? No, I never had a, rehearsal, a recital in my life. So I kind of resented that in a way. Because you didn't make it fun. That's right. And, and I'd have to practice in the morning before school. Of course, by this time, I, I told you that we first moved to Bronx and then Flushing. Okay, and then out to Long Island. And uh, we had a piano downstairs and we had a, my dad had a studio upstairs. And he had another piano up there, and uh, my dad would work there and do his arranging. Because by this time, he stopped playing with anybody because he was in demand, and he was so prominent that Sam Fox put his picture on the back of his arrangements, and under it, a Joseph Nussbaum arrangement. So, in fact, when I went to Red Lodge, I met a fellow that had bands, and he pulled out an old arrangement of my dad from the piano, Bill Pollard. 
He said, look at this. He said, we used to buy these. And then we'd mark out what we couldn't use. But they were a good basis. He said it, they were good arrangements. So um, I remember every day the mailman would come with envelopes and envelopes of uh, arrangements, professional copies that the publishing houses, not just the one he worked for, but a lot of them in New York would send their new songs to my dad, hoping that he would incorporate them on one of the radio shows he was doing. And uh, I grew up with those piles and piles of music. That's how I kind of learned so many lyrics that I know today. They've never left me. <laughs> and uh, that was, that was a strong memory I had. Let's take a uh, I grew up with those piles and piles of music. That's how I kind of learned so many lyrics that I know today. They've never left me. <laughs> and uh, that, was, that was a strong memory I had. You are uh, a child living with a professional musician, getting music lessons from your grandfather and playing piano. When you think back, what kind of, what different kinds of music were you exposed to and what, how did that happen? Did you used to sit around the living room and listen to records or how did, what were the different ways you got music? I got music at every turn. <laughs> My uh, dad is a, was still a great classical musician. And he, uh, we had records in those days. They weren't very good ones, but they were pretty good. My folks always had a season ticket to the opera every year, and also to Gilbert and Sullivan when they would come over from England. And uh, that's when I started to go. I would see some Gilbert and Sullivan. And the first opera they took me to was Romeo and Juliet at the Metropolitan Opera House. And, it was so emotional and dramatic. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about that. Talk about that opera and talk about opera in general. What what you learned at the time and how your life involved opera. Well, my dad would uh, take what they called a libretto and he would give me. It has the music in it, the whole opera, and also has a story and scenes. And before we would go to a Gilbert and Sullivan or to the Met, he would make me read that so I would understand what I was watching and listening to. And I love classical music, most of it. Now, I didn't love the ultra-modern at that time, but, you know, can't be Tchaikovsky <laughs> for a young, dreamy girl. Anyhow, um, the first one I went to, I fainted dead away in the last act when Romeo and Juliet did away with each other, you know. It was so emotional. She woke up from her deep, drug-induced sleep, and he had swallowed a potion. So he, she stabbed herself after that. Well, they had to take me out in the lobby because I, <laughs> I fell right out of my seat. Really? I was, yeah, I fainted that. And uh, to and that, that was the first opera of your life. That was the first one, and I'll always the first remember. The first of many. Yeah, I went to several. I went to see, Dad believed in everything. We went to see Wagner, and we went to see Italian operas, which were very gay and lighthearted most of the time, except for the, what's his name, the drummer? Puccini, you know, the, well, well anyway. Uh, yeah, and then uh, we had many musicals at our house. Uh, musicians would come over and they would play uh, trios, quartets, violinist would come and a cellist and so forth. My dad would play the piano and I used to first sit on the stairs, my bedroom was upstairs, and listen and then he, I finally coaxed him into letting me lay under the piano and listen, <laughs> which was very good. It was like having a a big set, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I still, to this day, love classical music. It's part of me. Is there, are there certain things that are your favorites? Oh, yeah. I liked the modern. I liked it. I liked 
like I say, I like Tchaikovsky, so romantic. I like the moderns, I like Debussy, and uh, like Le Maire. I liked uh, uh, Afternoon of a Fawn, which is very beautiful. Have you heard that one? Beautiful. Anyway, I liked all these uh, sort of romantic, uh, classical. Now we're jumping a little ahead, but as you began getting better at piano, did, is that what you played? I played classics, not tough stuff, not Hungarian Rhapsody, or not, I, I played uh, Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, and I played some Chopin etudes, and uh, I played some modern music. There was one called um, Fifth Avenue Fantasy, and one called, uh, what's that one I played at the concert? after I got married. can't remember. Um, I played pieces, and my grandfather was pleased with me. He said, you're doing very well. You have a lot to learn. He always finished every sentence with, you have a lot to learn. <laughs> and well, I knew it, because I used to practice in the morning, and I'd have to do a half hour of scales before that I could touch an exercise. That's how strict. And my father would be up there in the bedroom asleep. This was 7 in the morning sometimes. And if I'd make a mistake, I'd hear him slapping his slipper on the ceiling. I'd, I thought, I swear he was half asleep, but he knew when something was wrong. So I grew up with so much music, and then all these pop songs kept coming to the house every day. And there were wonderful shows at that time. And, my, you know, in the, in the uh, early 30s, I can't name you any, but we got nice copies of those with the colored jackets. And uh, so we're we're talking about a period when you're a little girl. You're taking piano lessons from your grandfather. You're living in a musical house. You're being exposed to opera, to classical music, everything, and to popular <laughs> music. You're seeing professional musicians come in and out of your house, and your father's career is moving forward and he's getting more successful and more famous as you grow up. Is, is all that right? That's right. As a matter of fact, I had mentioned a song called Fascinating Vamp, and it was what I call a medium hit. Well, if it played at the Roxy, it would have been a hit. So uh, in 1927, my dad took a trip and uh, went over to London, Berlin, and Paris, where they were going to perform his music, that, that selection. In fact, I have a program from uh, Follies Berger in, in Paris when they performed it. And, uh, and he went over for the performance? He went over to oversee, probably do the arranging, or I don't know yeah, what. Well, that's pretty big time. Yes. And he stayed over there for a couple of months, and he had a heck of a time. He went over on a a boat, of course, and came back that way. But that was in 1927, so I wasn't very old then. I was nine years old, huh? I think. But I remember it. I remember um, that they went to get him at the boat, and I know the taxi had an accident on the way home, but thank goodness it wasn't a bad one. Anyway, it was a success, and he enjoyed that, and he had a good time in Europe ate in all his favorite restaurants, and I think, I'm not sure, I think Simon Wor Worm had something to do with some of the negotiations on this, but I'm not sure. Anyhow, he came back, and also, let's see, how well, old was I when I, when Jumbo was produced? I'm trying to remember when he did that. That was in New York. Um... Billy Rose put a show on called Jumbo, which was later made into a movie, and it was a successful show. Jimmy Durante was, was in it. it. A, would you call it a Broadway show, or what would you call it? Yeah, well, it was. It was uh, Billy Rose was very uh, smart. He put it on like a three ring circus, and he had a story going. Where was it? It was in the Madison Square Garden. No, that other big hall. Hippodrome? Hippodrome. That's where it was. I think that's where old Barnum used to go when he had his big 
stuff going on. So he on. put on his show in an arena instead of a traditional theater. Yes, he had three rings. He had trapeze artists, and this, but this was a story. It was a story. So it was kind of his, almost like experimental theater, or real yeah, modern. Yeah, kind of. So, to put a play on in, a, in its own scene. I think so. I think so. Anyway, it was a big success, and my dad worked, uh, did all the arranging he could for that. Can you remember getting ready for that big show, the preparation? Yeah, I went to several rehearsals. I, I, as a matter of fact, I went out three, four times and got a sandwich for Billy Rose. He'd say, kid, will you go next door and get me a corned beef sandwich? Just mustard, he'd say. And he'd throw a bill at me. I don't know what kind it was. I don't remember. I was pretty small then. It wasn't quite 10. But I was uh, used to people and used to all this going on. So I would go and get it for him. He'd give me a dime tip when I'd come back. That was good. Thanks, kid, he'd say. <laughs> he always called me kid. Well, I was a kid. So I, uh, I remember that, and I remember what a glamorous rehearsal it was and how beautiful lights and costumes and the music. You know, that was, what was it, Hat Kern and Hammerstein? Which was it? I don't remember now. So it became a big hit? Yes. And some of the songs, like My Romance, became hits from it, and The Most Beautiful Girl in the World was another one of the songs. Beautiful music. I love it was to it this. This Can't Be Love, was that from that? Uh... No. I think they might have put it in the picture, but it wasn't in the I show. I remember uh, as the, on, in the picture as the horse rode around with the girl. Yeah, there are stay. Uh -huh. Was she singing This Can't Be Love? Or? Yeah, but I think th This Can't Be Love is from another one of their right, shows. It was from so a this became a big hit, and it was your father's music. So was that sort of a, a giant step forward? Oh, yes. He was very much in demand. He did open up his own publishing business in New York. And uh, what's the name of the musician's place? Ascap? No, the vicinity, the building. The Roselands? No, you know, the one where Tin Pan Alley. Oh. Okay? So uh, he went in partners with another man, and they uh, worked at it for a couple of years, but it wasn't. There were too many big publishers. And uh, he, that was a venture he made that didn't work out. But it was all right. He still had all the work in the world that he would want. And uh, he was doing a lot of radio at that time. And uh, things were going along well. Now, all this uh, has been talking about your father. What was your mother doing during this time? And what was she like when it came to music? Well, she had a beautiful, beautiful voice, soprano. She... Uh, Stopped her music when she got married, but she kept singing. She stopped a professional career. And after that, she used to uh, have her family, and then she would um, appear in uh, musicals they would have, and, you know, performances like if there was something uh, at the temple or if there was something local that was being put on. And she uh, looked great. She'd dress up have costumes and a uh, beautiful voice. She was a very scintillating person. She, uh, my dad was pretty quiet, quiet and accomplished, and she was the one that uh, always shone wherever she was. So they did a lot of entertaining in New York. I know we had guests over from as far away as London, Paris, and we had uh, other people from uh, New York that were artists that were in the Follies and that were in shows. And they would come to our house for music. We had musical evenings. And the ones that would come from overseas, from Europe, would stay at our house. We had a guest room. And um, it was very cosmopolitan, <laughs> I guess. Anyway, I liked it all. I thought it was a fascinating life, and I loved every minute of it. Well, when, how long did your grandfather teach you piano? Was it just while you were little, or did it continue for years? I'm trying to remember. I can't really... 
I was playing. I'm trying to remember. I think sometime in do high school. Do you remember any other teacher besides your grandfather? No. I never had another teacher. Maybe he gave up. I don't know. I, I was playing fairly well then. Yes. But something happened to me, and I just, I just turned against it for some reason. I was made to practice too much and didn't have the fun of <gasps> lessons that some people have. So uh, I, I gradually, and then they started giving me all these obligatory lessons. I took tennis, I took golf, I took painting, I took toe dancing. Uh, I had about five things I was taking because the well-bred young lady had to have all those things, you know, to grow up properly. So you went through a period of dance. I didn't remember that. Yeah, I wasn't very good at it. I had a good teacher. Catherine uh, Westcott was her name. And um, some of her dancers went on, and I saw their names. They went to Hollywood, and they were in some pictures dancing and, you know, musicals. And um, that was out on Long Island. And we used to uh, go to the tennis club and to the golf club until I was asked to leave the tennis, the yacht club one time. They had a little social barrier there, or racial barrier. <laughs> but what can you do? And that was for what? For my religion. And uh, So was, even though your house wasn't, well, I take it it wasn't super religious, no. but you were conscious of being Jews. Well, I went to Hebrew school, and so did my brother Jay with me. So, uh, but we had a teacher named Mr. Carp, and he was a mean son of a gun. He was pretty mean. But uh, we went there until we were 13, I guess, mm -hmm. the age. They didn't used to have bat, bat mitzvahs then. Why didn't they? It's, I think it's because it's a newer thing. I guess so. My brother people. had his, but I, I didn't have any. I it was remember. a reform thing, and it was invented not that long ago. Oh. But, you know, the world of your Jewish world and your musical world, you know, they kind of, it sounds like they touched each other. Were a lot of those musicians and those people Jewish? Oh, all the good ones. <laughs> Excuse me for saying it that way. But... Uh, because he was in the publishing business, he yeah. was in the composing and arranging business, he was a musician himself, he was around the shows, and uh, eventually, of course, he got into movies. It, it must have been quite a Jewish world. Huh? Oh, yes, it was a Jewish world. I know they would say, are we, gonna, are we considering this man or this man for first violinist? And they'd say, which one's Jewish? <laughs> they had that schmaltzy. <laughs> anyway, it was nice. Yeah, a lot of good musicians, and a lot of their drunken wives, I remember, at parties. Maybe they had some time, too much time alone, I don't know. But anyway, to me, life was a fairy tale. I loved it. And my dad took me wherever he could. He took me to the circus, he took me to rehearsals of his radio shows. I sit on the chair, we'd go into the studio, and there'd be ten chairs, folding chairs, and that's where the visitors would sit. He said, now we're giving you all gum and you chew it so you don't cough during the <laughs> broadcast. We were right in the studio with everything going on. And Live it was, radio. Huh? Yeah, it was kind of fun. And uh, I got to meet everybody. He knew everybody. I was introduced to every famous conductor in New York City at the Paramount, at the radio studios, and uh, he'd say, I want you to meet uh, Mr. Huffman. He's head of music here, and <laughs> I'd write, walk right up and say, how do you do? I'm Selma Nussbaum, <laughs> before he even opened his mouth. I wasn't a bit bashful. I don't think I am now, even. I'm just quieter. So, um, and I started collecting batons, and I had a wonderful collection, and I don't know what happened to them. You mean uh, conductor's baton? Yeah, I'd have the conductor, I'd meet, sign it. I don't know what I did with him. Probably left him home and somebody snitched him or snatched him, maybe joy. I don't know where. Anyway, like I said, it was a glorious life. 
What do you remember about your little brothers and sisters? Were they doing the same things you did? Well, more or less. Jay's about five years younger than I am, and Joy's about three years younger, I think, than Jay. And uh, by that time, though, my mother had died, and things changed abruptly in our house because we were brought up by a, a whole string of maids and, and housekeepers that were, weren't very good to us and didn't care much about us, as I remember now. I was old enough to know Jay wasn't and Joy wasn't, so they probably didn't like it because I had a very loving mother. Uh, Joy always says I was lucky. I had a loving mother and father who were very healthy and in love with each other, and that's why I turned out like I did, <laughs> maybe. So um, they had a succession of help that wasn't good. Anyhow. Um, well, you know, I was thinking because you were talking about Jumbo and you were talking about your dad's career, you know, slowly you began to approach the really big change where your family moved to Hollywood. Yeah. Why don't you talk about that? How did that happen? I mean, you didn't see it coming, did you? Well, sort of. I, uh, uh, radio had gotten very big by then. And uh, a lot of the moving picture stars that were big were coming into New York to be on radio shows. And gradually, the business moved, and they were starting to do bigger radio shows, half-hour shows like Rudy Valley and Eddie Cantor and so forth, and they were done in Los Angeles, where the movies were made, in Hollywood. And uh, my dad was still working, but he said, you know, I'd like to look around there. And at that same time, he got a telegram from Billy Rose asking him to come to Texas where they were having a centennial. Was it a centennial? And uh, they were, he was putting three shows on, if you see the picture. So the centennial of Texas was, I think, 1936. Yeah. Because 1836 was Texas, so 1936. That's right. And there were, my dad went out to do the arrangements and he sent my dad a neat telegram. It said, come on, Joe, uh, come out here and join me in the biggest entertainment venture of the century. That's how Billy Rose was. He was so cute, though. Uh, and he uh, was putting on Jumbo, and he was putting on uh, a, a production show where he had swimmers. You could see all that in that Barbara Streisand picture where she marries Jimmy Kahn, and it's called something lady. Anyway... And the other show was uh, uh, called Casa Manana, and it was a nightclub where they had... Well, that's how Billy Rose did things. He'd put three on at once, just like his three-ring circus. And um, Dad went out and stayed, and then he uh, called home, and he said, you know, I'm, I'm going to take a trip to Hollywood on the way home. wasn't right there, but he went there. <laughs> so he... Uh, he was a great advocate of flying. He loved to fly. He flew all over Europe when nobody flew. I mean, 1927. He flew from where he was, London, Berlin, Paris, and back and forth. And he loved it. He wrote uh, some letters about it, how the people looked like ants when they'd come down a little bit, and uh, all about the early flying. And um, so he went out to Hollywood, and he... Uh, made the round of studios just to see who we knew there. And he ran into a, a conductor that he worked for in New York named Nathaniel Shilkrit. He wrote a song, I think it was called Old Rocking Chair. So it was a big hit. Anyway, he grabbed my dad and gave him a big hug. He said, just the man I need, Joe. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> he took him right in and put him to work, arranging. He said, you, you stay here. This is the place to be. And that was at, I think, RKO. And um, so Dad said, well, I think I'm going to stay here. He said, but I, he said, you, you told Clara, he said, you better take, keep the family, their schools out. 
and I'll look around. And he lived he lived with a family called Gleichen, uh who were related to, uh, she was the mother of a very famous composer named Rudolf Frimmel, who wrote The Indian Love Call and Donkey Serenade and very prominent guy. My dad was very good friends with him. And uh, he lived with the man and his wife, Mrs. Gleach, and she'd remarried. She used to be married to Frimmel. That was it. She was young, young Rudy Frimmel's mother. And uh, he liked it right away. And so we stayed in New York. He stayed out there and he worked. And uh, school came and we left. I can't remember how old I was. Bobby was a baby. So you, so you packed up and sold the house and, and just moved? We rented the house. And I don't know what happened to all the beautiful stuff that was in that house. I could, my dad's studio was furnished, and the whole house we had. Anyway, I remember Clara saying he hated to leave his beautiful. Was it a Bluthner piano? Or uh, I decided there's some story about leaving a piano because it was upstairs and, and it was too yes. hard to get out. And yeah. In the end, it just got left. You should have seen it. They painted it uh, gold blotched with beautiful green all over it. It was the prettiest thing you ever saw. You couldn't see the wood. Although I suppose later on somebody took that, stripped that. Yeah, it was a nice piano. So you he, rented the house just in worked, case it was a, a failed experiment and yeah. you came back. He uh, used to uh, work up there. That's where he would arrange up in the studio. And uh, What was the address of that house? 21212 Maxwell Avenue. And 21212. I, 212-12, and then I went back and found out they changed Maxwell Avenue to 33rd Street when Joe and I went there. It's blinking now. When Joe and I went there, we went in all through the house. Dad was there, but he stayed. He wouldn't go up three floors to the studio. And we looked down, and I told Joe, and he looked at the uh, things that Albert had designed up there, beautiful cutouts from black cardboard, notes, music, famous people, everything. On four sides, he had skylines of Paris, London, um, the Far East. It was once all the, the, what do you call the slanty parts of houses, you know. Mm -hmm. And he had a, he'd have a whole scene across there and was beautiful. And that was the place that you left. Well, yeah. this is an interesting time to end part one of our interview because you're moving to Hollywood and it's a big change. Yes. But, you know, as you look, and we'll talk about Hollywood and those Hollywood years, and we kind of have in our other tapes, but we never talk that much about this period in your life with music. So when you think about music, what does music mean to you? Love. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what I'd do without music. I can I can be in the worst funk in the world and not music. I'm always saying if and when I get ready to uh, leave this mortal coil, I hope somebody's around to have music for me all the time while I'm in bed sick, if I'm sick, because <laughs> it's my love, and all kinds. And, you've, and in your life, you've listened to music by great people, you've been exposed yep. to music through your blood and your relatives, you've played music. Mm -hmm. You've written lyrics. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to tell you about writing a song. Oh, no, that was in Hollywood. Yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah. But okay. I mean, it's just kind of interesting to think about back that m music is something that I think is in your blood. It comes in your genes. It it's pulses essential. In your body. Yeah. And you had a lot of it from a lot of different places, from places in Poland and from places in That's Russia really... and places in England and all that kind of came together just, in just, your house. Just thinking about it, I'm smiling. You notice that? That's how it is to me. And I'm so happy that my sons love music. Some of them more than others, but <laughs> um, it's nice. So let me ask you, just thinking back, if you had to give one answer, what's your favorite opera? Oh, definitely the first one where I fainted. I was so Romeo emotional. And Juliet. What's, yes. your, what's your favorite Broadway musical of all time? Oh, my, my, my. That's pretty hard. Name one or two. 
Oh. I like all Rodgers and Hart and Rodgers and Hammerstein. I, I can't pick one. Uh, Gershwin. How Fair can enough. you pick? So how about how about the big band era? Who were your favorite big bands? Who do you think was the best or some of the best? Well, my favorite was Tommy Dorsey for all round good, solid music. But there were so many in his category. Glenn, before Glenn Miller, there was a band called Glenn Gray that I loved. And uh, then there were Artie Shaw, so many. I was so a, you're saying about the big bands, there were so many good ones. That was, the, that was the late 30s. So were you conscious of black music versus white music? Yes, indeed, I was, and I loved it. Uh, I used to go into the black section for music, and Jay was good friends with a few musicians, and my dad, of course, black was the same as any other color to him as far as music goes, and uh, we used to go down to one of the clubs we went this one night, and uh, Art Tatum was playing. And we sat there, and he, know, he knew Art Tatum. And Art Tatum came over and sat at our table and during his whole break. And they talked, excuse me, I have a little hiccup. They talked about music and where they'd played, and they were friends in New York. And uh, Jay had a friend, and we used to go to the black section. Sometimes we would uh, just go to a club and listen to music. We'd go to the Cotton Club. Of course, that was pretty white, mostly white people there, but colored black entertainment. And uh, then we'd go someplace and have some good chicken or <laughs> something else like that. And, uh, How about singers? Who were your favorite one or two singers? Well, I, I have to mention Ella first. She was... First and foremost, <laughs> for for pop singing, but I had a lot of favorites when I was young. I heard one of them today. I haven't heard for f probably fifty years. Buddy Clark, he was my a mild sensation. I heard uh, and then Tony Bennett and uh, Sinatra. As a matter of fact, Frank Sinatra sang one of the songs I wrote. I was lucky enough to have it on a Tommy Dorsey contest. And uh, he sang it with Joe Stafford and the Pied Pipers, but that's later on. All right, well, we'll get to later on, but yeah. it's kind of nice to visit these these early years of music. Mm. I'm glad because I know music has always meant a lot to you, and it'll be nice to have these thoughts of yours to look back on. <laughs> 